And I don't have anything special for you tonight, this kind of milky tonight. Bob Jones used to say to me, to say, you know, he said, not many people are going to follow you in the strong emphasis you give. And I didn't understand what he meant when he said that, but I understand it now. Because I put a lot of emphasis on the book. And uh, this day and age, you don't get a lot of people to take to that. But he said, you, you can always use milk, desire the sincere milk of the word. And he said, milk's always good for folks. And so I'm just going to talk tonight about some very basic things. I'm talking about, we're going to talk tonight about seven basic things that have to do with Christian victory in, in the life of the Christian over sin. And Romans chapter 6 verse 14 is the statement. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, uh, sin shall have no dominion over you, not let it run you. A little bit later in the passage there, he says it's not to, to, to reign over you. In your mortal body you should obey, obey it and the lust thereof. And so that's the, 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 the will of God for a child of God when you get right down to it real simple. The will of God, of God for a child of God is just to live a sinless life. <laughs> Nothing to it, huh? And uh, the question is, how do you do it? Amen. Well, there are seven basic principles you have to follow. We're going to talk about these tonight. And the first of these uh, has to be Bible reading. Amen. Now, there's no way to get victory over sin without Bible reading. Uh, Psalm 119 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? And without the word, there's no way to get victory. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 says, uh, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And those things are absolutely essential. Uh, the old saying is that we learned when we were back in, uh, I wasn't back there, but all the churches I've pastored, the kids were back there. Back in uh, Datification Bible School in those places was real simple. And it was, uh, this book will keep me from my sins, or my sin will keep me from this book. Now you'd be amazed how accurate that little thing is. That book lies around for a long time. It's because something in your life is preventing you from looking at it. And the more you spend time with that book, the less time you'll spend with sin. The more time you spend with sin, the less time you'll spend with that book. And of course, when I say that book, I'm referring to a King James 1611 authorized version. I'm never referring to some other so-called modern translation. Reading a modern translation is kind of like shaving with a banana. <laughs> It doesn't do you any good. Yeah. That uh, you know, the consultant, the consultant for the New International Version, was one of the language consultants was a woman, a woman named Dr. Mullencott, um, uh, M O L L E N K O T T, and she wrote a book called "Is the Homosexual My Neighbor?" And the idea was the Bible says you love your neighbors yourself. So the question is, should I love this queer next door to me like I love myself, you see? And she was a consultant for the NIV, and when she uh, commented on the past of the NIV in that book, I've got them all written down on the page number, what she wrote. Uh, she didn't say that sodomy or perversion was a sin one single time. She said the sin of Sodom was being inhospitable to folks. Uh, yeah, right. And then they took the word sodomy and sodomite clean out of First and Second Kings. It isn't found one place in NIV. And when she got over there to Romans chapter 1, we're talking about men with men and women with women. She said, well, that was back in the days of Paul and the pagan society in which he lived. And that has no op application to a, a modern day Christian. Now, that's the kind of quality you have behind the New International Version. And that's why when you read it, the Holy Spirit doesn't bear witness to it. That's why folks like Bibles like that. They're comfortable with them. You know, I'd like to be comfortable with my religion. Uh huh. Yeah, that's it. That's it. So it's kind of like shaving the banana. It won't do you any good. Come to nothing. I mean, I don't know why they keep uh, arguing about it and talking about it, uh, how, what it should be and what it shouldn't be. The, 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 the age old, the timeless truths of man and man's failures have been tried out on five continents 500,000 times a day, and certain things have always been proved to be true, and certain things have always been proved to be false, and there isn't any way anything new ever came that ever changed it. I mean, on all continents where people lie and steal, there's trouble. On all continents where there's homosexuals and child molestation, there's trouble. On all continents where anybody breaks those commandments and violates what's in that book, they always pay for it. They pay to hell. They pay hell for it. Right. That doesn't have to be proved. That's been proven in man's history for 6,000 years on five continents. And right now, while I'm standing here right now, it's going on this continent five million times a day. 
maybe five million times an hour, I don't know. You don't have to prove the truth in the Word of God. The truth in the Word of God, they're, 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 they're clear, they're there, and they, they work. They work. Now, whenever I see some Girl Scout getting ready to go out to a northeastern the surf without a life preserver, I say, boy, they're gone for sure. When I see a Christian trying to start out his life, and start out his life fooling around with an ASB and a new ASB and an RSB and all that junk, I say, you can kiss that Girl Scout goodbye. He's gone. <laughs> and they are. All right, the first thing is Bible reading. Bible reading. The next thing is going to have to be taken care of, we call, we call promise claiming. Promise claiming. You've got to find a promise there somewhere. You've got to find some time in there where you come to a place where you need help, and you've got to claim a promise from God. Like, my God shall supply all your need through His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Or like, I can all do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Or thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me. Or cast all I care upon Him, for He cares for you. Or we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the call according to His purpose. You've got to get a promise and claim it. I don't know how many times I've uh, been to Christian K where young fellows were there and, and giving invitations. Some kid come down there about 18, bawling his eyes out. And I'll ask you, what's the matter? And he says, well, I got right here last year, and I get right here every year, and I go back and get with the same old crowd and get all messed up again. And he said, I was right here last year, but I got back with the old crowd and got all messed up again. And I say, well, did you memorize that verse of Scripture I told you to memorize? And he'll say, what verse? Yep. Uh-huh. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation taken you, but you, is common to, to every man. God is faithful not to suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. God is faithful. He'll make a fire escape for a fiery trial. Amen. But you have to get the verse. Yes. You can't stand there and say, oh, blah, 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 the devil just kick you on into it. You gotta, you gotta claim a promise. Turn to Romans chapter 4, 21 for this one. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. Romans chapter 4, 21 is a, a statement there in Abraham. And about Abraham, he, when the Bible said he, he, he was fully persuaded what God promised he was able to produce. Fully persuaded. Romans chapter 4, 21. You've got to get your promise be fully persuaded that God's going to do it. You say, well, I claim a promise that it doesn't come to pass. Uh, claim a promise for the glory of God. Get some promise if you're having trouble in your Christian life. Get some promise that, Lord, I'm asking this for your glory. And if you answer this prayer, uh, it'll redound to your glory, and it'll help your name, and it'll help your cause. And whether it hurts me or not, I'm not interested. But if you answer this thing I'm claiming about, it'll bring you glory. Try that. Try that. Well, if some of you, if, if, if some of you, if, if, if people like John Paul Getty and Ted Turner and Jacob Astor and Commodore Vanderbilt and that bunch and John D. Rockefeller gave you a promise like you find in that book, whatever thing you ask and pray and you believe you shall receive, you shall receive. If they gave you a thing like that, you'd be sitting up all night writing out checks. Amen. If they said, ask and you shall receive, one of those fellows, rich as fellow did, man, you'd be writing out a pile of checks that high, asking for $20,000 15,000 times in a row. And God give you promises and you never claim them, a lot of them. Look for a promise and claim it. One time a German uh, was going to the United States back to Germany and he got on the plane. Every he had a good, good flight, a couple of meals were served in the plane. And when it came by, he told him, no thank you, no thank you. And the third meal came by, he finally got more hungry than he could stand. And he said to the stewardess, he said, uh, I'll take one this time, what does it cost? <laughs> and she said, the meals are free, the meal come with a ticket. The meal come with a ticket. Amen. That's why some of you are, some promises come with your salvation. Yeah. When, you get the, when you get Christ, the promise of God are yea and amen through Jesus Christ. They're in there. You, now, get a hold of a promise and claim the thing. Claim the thing. Well, that's the next thing we call dead reckoning. Amen. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 6. We call dead reckoning. And this is the most important thing in victory over sin. And it's the one we fail to use most of the time. Amen. And dead reckoning means a reckoning by the North Star, by a fixed point out there in the world talking about dead reckoning they're talking about that. We talk about dead reckoning, we're talking about real dead reckoning. We're talking about reckoning yourself and need to be dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Hey! That's there in Romans chapter 6 verse 11. He that is dead is freed from sin. 
You have to reckon yourself dead. You have to reckon what God said is so. And God says, you're dead, you're dead. Amen. A dead man can't sin. That's right. The, 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 the cemeteries here in, in Pensacola are filled with people who live, live sinless lives. <laughs> They don't wear shorts. They don't have to worry about cigarettes or bingo or nothing else. They don't go to the movies. They don't do the Watusi or wear matador britches. They just lie there dead. And the Bible said, reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Now you have to reckon what God said is so. The thing is so hard to reckon. When I say that, I speak for myself. I'm as human as any of you. And it's hard to reckon that flesh dead because that flesh puts up such a fuss. Yes, that flesh, look at these kids down here. They're good kids. I know that. Uh, I mean, I think all kids are good, you know. You're kicking the tail end once in a while, slapping the face, but that don't hurt them. I mean, they're still, they're still good kids. And you take these kids down, and you know the thing that makes them different from adults, really adults, is that, they, that uh, the, the, the mind is self-centered. The kid is, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm hot, I'm cold, shut the door, open the window, when do we get out? I go to go to the bathroom. Why do I go to bed? Why do I have to go to bed now? I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to take a nap. When are we going to get up? When are we going to start? Just the whole life is like that. Yeah. Now, you know, by the time you're 20 or 21 or 25 or 30, you ought to be getting over that, some of that. Amen. You know. Amen. But, uh, but a lot of people don't, <laughs> you see. But that, you know what that, that kid is? That's just uh, flesh, that's all. And we have that flesh in us like this. Yeah. It's here right now. I mean, I'm pushing the 75. It's still there. It's still there. I want this. I need this. I got to have this. Why that? And why this? And why that? Well, that cut pick and stoplight. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, that thing is there. What you have to do is reckon yourself dead, not dead reckoning. One time, one time. Well, uh, well, uh, well uh, a dead man can't worry about the stoplight. <laughs> Only a live man worries about it. I vow I'm going to get me a 22 and shoot that. Two of them lights out coming down Palafox. I have a time of them things. I've seen them things. I have seen, you know how many times I've been through there? I counted up the other day, 8,000. I've been from down in the Brent area, out here and back, 8,000 times up that highway. And that light will come on sometime for five seconds, sometime 30, sometime 25, sometime 15, sometime it won't even turn. The fellas, well, is the car come the sideways? No, it ain't. No, it ain't. I've seen a car come the sideways and the thing there sitting red not even turn on for him. I've seen the, I've seen the thing turn turn red when there was no car coming. And I take that, that those are observations of somebody who's alive, you see. <laughs> <laughs> now this has to be dead reckoned. You have to reckon what God has said is true whether you believe it or not. One time a fellow in Long Island uh, wrote, he wrote to a certain company, he wanted to get him a barometer. And they sent him a barometer, and he got that barometer, and he, when he got that barometer out of the, uh, of the mail, looked at that thing, the arrow was stuck on hurricane. <laughs> and he shook that thing and banged that thing around, he just stayed there in hurricane, and he, when he went to work the next morning, he went downtown and wrote the nasty letter down in his office about the barometer that didn't work, and gave him down the country about it. And then he got kind of stormy that day, and then he took the ale or whatever it was on back out there, Long Island, where he worked for him. He got out there. He didn't have to worry about his barometer anymore. His barometer was gone, and his house was gone. <laughs> a hurricane hit Long Island. <laughs> that thing was back there about 1890, and the hurricane not supposed to hit up Long Island, but that one did. But that barometer told him the truth. Now, dead reckoning is by the North Star. The North Star will tell you the truth. Amen. If you ever lost someplace, you can find the North Star. That's north. That's north. No matter where you are, if you can see that North Star, that's north. And you reckon you, reckon you go by something that's fixed. Now, the Bible's fixed. And the Bible says you're dead. And your life is hid with God in Christ. You have to dead reckon. Now, the next thing we call instant praying. Instant praying. Now, these are the, uh, these are the fundamentals. And these aren't the fundamentals of creedal beliefs doctrinally, doctrinally. But these are the fundamentals of practical Christian life. And these are the fundamentals of practical Christian living, these things. And this is instant praying. Take your Bible and turn to uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 13. Romans chapter 12, verse 13. Romans chapter 12, verse 13. Uh, notice uh, continuing instant in prayer. What does that mean? That means right on the spot. Right on the spot. You don't wait. You don't wait. 
you have trouble with the test question, you uh, pray and ask God for the answer. If the car breaks down, you feel a tire going out, start praying right away. Before you get out and look for the jack and the jack handle and can't find it, start praying right away. Uh, one of the bad habits I have is I lose something, I, I look and look and look for it and forget to pray for it. That's a bad habit. I want to pick that thing up. I used to pray real, for stuff like that real quick. By the last five or six years, I've gotten the place where I'm looking and looking and looking instead of praying about it. And you hardly ever find it. You hardly ever find it. When I lose something, I think right away somebody stole it, you know, <laughs> right away off the bat. But I can't find it, say, well, it's gone, just vanish. I have seen stuff vanish in thin air. I mean, I have seen it. I've seen it disappear out of the, I mean, never show up. But 25 years, didn't show it up yet. But you think you'll stumble around the house and look and look and look, you know, and I'll be grumbling about it. You know, Pam say, well, just be patient. It's around here somewhere, you know. That's a big help. It's around here somewhere. <laughs> well, sure, it's around here somewhere. But uh, what she usually does is pray about it. I'll go around the house. I'll say, I'll give five bucks. Anybody can find my comb, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'll give them the money. I'll give them the money. I get five bucks for my keys, five bucks you find my shoes. Uh, Mike or Brian find them, they get five bucks all of that. I can't spend the whole day messing around looking for it. <laughs> and about that time, we'll pay them to come up and say, here it is. <laughs> that kind of thing. Now, what that means is when you lose something, the best thing to do is, first of all, before you do anything, you start praying about it. One, one of the great examples of that in the Old Testament is Nehemiah. And Nehemiah has called him before the king, and his countenance is sad, and he's worried about fearing the sad before the king, because that's a rule. You couldn't appear depressed before the king, and you'd never lose your head. You always had to look cheerful, no matter what was wrong. And when he comes in there, and the king asks him, Why is your countenance sad? For what do you make request? And the next verse says, So I prayed to the God of heaven and said, O king. Amen. So Nehemiah chapter 1 or chapter 2, he says, uh, what do you make requests for? And he said, I prayed to God and said, O king, which means he's standing right there, he says, now Lord, give, help this fellow, give him the grace to do it. Well, then, then he says it. I used to watch Bob Jones Sr. Before I got to know him uh, too well, I couldn't uh, understand some things about him, but I got to study him while I was going to school there. And, I, and after a while, I began to learn something about that fellow. That fellow was saying prayer most all the time. You go up to ask him a question, he'd look at you like this. He'd say, and then he'd say something. You're asking him a question. He's saying, now, Lord, show me what to say. I don't want to tell this fellow. Give me something to say. I, when I go out and take a Bible for him, I do that when, I, when they ask those questions. When I get, God gets asked a question, I say, Lord, I haven't got anything. Give me something quick. Don't, don't let your word fall because of me. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> and then, now, that's be instant in prayer right on the spot. Yeah. Now, you young people, you young people here tonight, you have trouble with sin. Sure, you're going to have trouble with sin. Flee youthful lusts. You're young, you're full of vim and vigor, and the devil's going to work on you. Well, let me tell you something. One of the best ways in the world to stand out of trouble is just when the thing hits, you pray right then. Amen. Amen. Not a minute later, not 10 seconds later, right then. I'm in the picture's wrong on the thing. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eye. Flip. Amen. See, like that. And if you can't make you can't make the thing flip when you say I'll set no wicked thing before my eye, well then say Lord, uh, Lord help me. I need to get rid of this thing. Help me right now and clip. It'll go. It'll go. But you don't stand there and say, well, maybe a few more minutes. Well, I know Lord isn't quite right, but but well I'll I'll turn off in a while. Is it? And you're over the cliff. That's right. You're over the cliff. Amen. Amen. This is called instant praying, instant praying. Uh, when, when you deal with somebody have a hard time winning to Christ, they're giving you a rough time or talking nasty about the Bible or about the Holy Spirit or cussing or blasting, that kind of thing, one of the best things to do, do is just remember to be instant in prayer. Uh, you'd be amazed the effect it has on some people when you're talking to dealing with them. I've done this several times. When the, when the conversation gets rough, say, well, okay, uh, I enjoyed talking with you, and then bowed my head and prayed right in front of them. Boy, when you look up nine times out of ten, they are shaking like a leaf in a hurricane. You talk to some guy, I talked to a guy a couple of months back, he said, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe much stuff. I don't care about going to hell. He don't care nothing about going to hell. He said, no. I said, okay, Lord, bless this fellow right now. And he said, he doesn't mind going to hell, so if you want to put him there, it's okay with him. And went through that thing and, <laughs> oh, boy, man. I'm going to look back, fellow's face just white as my shirt. 
Now, don't, don't forget prayer and personal work. Don't forget when you do and deal with somebody and think bogs down, just bow your head and pray right in front of you. I thought break up the ice, break up all kinds of things. <laughs> all right, now take your Bible and turn to Hebrews 9, 14. Hebrews 9, 14. We call this one here blood pleading. Blood pleading. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And in Hebrews chapter 9, 14, he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who hath offered himself to God without spot, purge your conscience, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. Now, to purge means to clean out. When he says purge and clean out, he means that uh, God has a, a catharist that will clean, clean you out and purgate you and purge you out and, and get the old stuff of your dead works, what you used to do for you save, out of your mind and, and blast it and take care of it and get rid of it. That's the blood. The blood, it will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. And don't worry about the people make fun of it and talk about us having a butcher house, slaughterhouse religion. They haven't got anything that works, and we do. <laughs> All these fellows, they got these fellows so smart. They, all this C, CIA and UN, EC and NEA and all these smart intellectual leaders and all these great world leaders, they got so much hot air and gas bag they're blowing them out, but they haven't got anything that works. The blood works. It works. What do you got for a substitute? I mean, time comes to die. You're out there, stretched out there. What do, what do, what do you got now, huh? Some nuts sitting down and telling you about how they're going to get to Mars. You ain't going to get to Mars. You're going to kick the bucket. <laughs> you're lying in that hospital and the bills are piling up and the family's around. You're in that little silly linen thing they have you wear. You're lying there fading away and you're heading out in eternity. Now, come on now. What do you got? What do you got? Huh? What do you got superior to the death of somebody who died in your place so you don't have to face God unprepared? Amen. What do you got any better than that? You ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. Yin yang, Buddhism, meditation, joy, joy, living right, Ten Commandments, you know, golden rule, little old sacrament. You ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. I remember you die, you're going to leave a lot of stuff with you. When, when you die and step out there, you're going to have to meet somebody on the other side that you had here. He's going to have to take you over. When you go, man, your church and your sacraments and your golden rule, they stay right here. And your belief, your religion, and every place else, you need a little transportation. <laughs> Now that's blood pleading. I had a fellow tell me about that up at, uh, at a rescue mission in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Must have been about, <coughs> about a year after I was saved. About a year after I was saved, I preached in a rescue mission up there. When I got through preaching, <coughs> the rescue mission superintendent came around to me and he said, that uh, testimony had the right ring to it. I said, oh, do I'm saved. And he said, you know, a man that lived like you lived better how to learn how to plead the blood. I said, what? He said, a man that lived like you lived better learn how to plead the blood. I didn't know what he meant. And he didn't explain it. He wasn't a very educated fellow, and not much of a theologian. Whatever he had in mind, he couldn't explain to me. But he said, you just need to plead the blood. But I found out. Amen. I found out when, when certain things went through my mind, old thoughts began to come back to me, and old things I'd seen and done and said, and other things began to come back to me. I found out the only way to purge that stuff out of my mind or my memory or my conscience was by pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd have to say, Lord, take that thing and soak it in the blood, wash it in the blood. I want it sunk in the blood. I want it drowned in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it works. Amen. It works. That's called blood pleading. All right, the next basic we call simply thanksgiving. Amen. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 5. This is called thanksgiving. Giving thanks. In everything give thanks. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse, what is verse is that? 18, verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now these things here are what we call, uh, these things here are what we call the basics. And these are the basics have to do with, with, uh, with Christian life, a successful Christian life, a life that pleases God. In everything give thanks. Do you thank God for hospitals and doctors and nurses? I don't, I don't care nothing about them. But I'm thankful for them, really. I mean, I'm thankful when I have an operation, I have an anesthesia. Amen. I thank God they don't have to come and hit me over here with a ball bat till they saw off my leg. <laughs> I mean, there's some good things about it, you know. Amen. I mean, you ever thank God you can walk? Amen. A lot of Christians can't. You ever thank God you can go to the bathroom? Amen. That's a blessing. 
Ever thank God you can eat? Ever thank God you can breathe? Uh, why the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, the reason why God gave them up was because they didn't glorify God, neither were they thankful. Amen. Bob Jones Sr. said, when, when gratitude dies on a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. When gratitude dies, oh, that's well nigh hopeless. I like the first four or five words that Miss Dickman sang tonight. I forget what they were, but they were good. They were good. And the idea was no matter how tough it is, it sure been good. Yeah. It sure been good. And it sure has. You want to be thankful. Everything is thanksgiving. Uh, you take, uh, you can thank God you aren't the product of evolution if you can't thank God for anything. I mean, aren't you glad you're not a monkey man or ape woman or something? You know, me Tars and you Jane and all that stuff. <laughs> I'm mean, you call a Pope a hairless ape and folks get so upset. <laughs> Why would you get upset if I called John Paul a hairless ape? That's what he is according to what he believes. Yes, he says he believes in theistic evolution. Yes, That's the standard teaching of the Vatican. Hello, you hairless ape. <laughs> Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> and you know, you get talking like that, folk get so upset. That uncouth, vulgar ruckman, how dare you? Shut your mouth, you hypocrite. Amen. If you believe you came a monkey, don't you object me calling you a monkey. Yes, you're, just, you're just monkeying around. I mean, I mean... I might, I'd have a right to get upset if you called me a monkey. I ain't no monkey. My father's God. Amen. Not Cheetah or King Kong or Tyson or somebody. <laughs> you know, you know, I got a friend up there in Holland, Michigan. He's, I don't know he's still alive. My name is Joe Boss. And Joe Boss, of course, from Boss, you know, they come over here and change the spelling. And Joe Boss, he got his American citizenship in the American Army fighting in Korea after World War II. And he, uh, Germany's having a hard time and people starving over there, really, and things really rough. And he came to America and got his citizenship fighting in Korea in 1950. And uh, he was up there on the line one night and around uh, Thanksgiving time, and they gave him some frozen turkey. And it was really frozen, you know. And uh, they're trying to heat that stuff up where they could eat the stuff. And the captain came down the line one night inspecting the outpost. And he came down the line and saw Joe up there trying to get his teeth in some of that frozen chick uh, frozen turkey. And he said, how's it going, Joe? And she said, Joe said, ah, captain, this good. Never had it so good. This is the best we ever had. We never got to eat like this at our home. That old captain slapped him on the back up there in the snow, you know, about 15 below zero, and said, Joe, said, I wish I had 10,000 men just like you. Do you know that's how God feels about you when you start being thankful Amen. for something that ain't much? Amen. Lord, bend over heaven and pat you on the back and call your name so you know some wish I had 10,000 just like you. It's there. It's there. Amen. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. This will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You fellows, you can, if you got a good, if your wife's a good cook, you can thank God for that. Amen. Amen. So any woman can cook. No, they can't. All of them can't. <laughs> Some guys after they have to reheat a TV dinner and call it a rerun. <laughs> Guy got up from supper one night and said, "Compliments, my compliments to the microwave." <laughs> one time, a, a fellow said about his about his his wife. He said, "You know something? If our can opener had a short in it, I wouldn't get to eat nothing for about five days." <laughs> You can thank God for something. You can thank God for something. Amen. Right. Oh, now that isn't all. The last these things we call, last these things we call, soul winning. Amen. Sometimes you can call this witnessing, but it's an attempt. It's an attempt to win people to Jesus Christ. The way to stay fresh and fruitful and faithful is win the souls of Jesus Christ. Hey. Or make an attempt to. If you can't do it, at least make an attempt to. Don't the world get you down. Don't the world beat you down. Let, don't the unsaved people make fun of God and fun of Christ without talking back to Him and saying something back to Him yeah. and getting something done. Two of my favorite characters, char characters are a fellow named Holy Hubert. The other guy's last name, I forget his last name, his first name is Jed. And those guys are street preachers who spent their time preaching to university students. And what they do is just travel all year around the universities and preach on these campuses. Boy, if they don't get into some stuff. They don't get some stuff. That fellow called Holy Hubert, he's blind now. He's up in his 60s. He's partially blind from beatings he got at Berkeley. 
back there in the 60s when he was uh, preaching to the students in, during the hippie uh, years and those kind of things. And you take old Holy Hubert would get up there and preach to mobs of eight, nine, ten thousand people, and I mean he'd uh, he'd come down on them, and he'd answer them, he'd witness that guy'd stand up and speak up for Jesus Christ. I mean that crowd they'd get raised hand and say, "Would you let your sister marry a black?" He'd say, "No, sir." Well, that crowd just have a fit, you know. He's, Little, little National Education Association, college educated people, they're the most thin skinned, narrow minded, prejudiced, bigoted hypocrites you've met in your life. Goes, ah, you know, like the dying, you know. And I asked him why, and after it got quieted down, he said, I have too much respect for your race. He said, if I let my sister marry one of you, I, your people wouldn't accept. The white kids that my sister had, and the uh, white folks wouldn't accept the black ones that your black had, and I think more of my children, more of your children, now let them suffer, thing like that. Amen. Wham! He'd get them. He'd get them. That crowd would start yelling at the fellow to say, you've you got to be an idiot to be a Christian. You've got to be an idiot to be a Christian. Your Christian has to be an idiot. And Holy Hubert would say, you qualify, you qualify. <laughs> <laughs> He had to get up there one time, got going. The fellow said, he said, he said, Jesus saves. And one of those hecklers said, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And he says, that's right, he saves. And the heckler yelled, he saves green stamps. <laughs> Nobody hollered and hooted when they got quiet. Holy Hubert said, that's right, and you're the greenest one of the whole bunch. Amen. God bless your dirty heart. <laughs> <laughs> he used to always say, God bless your dirty heart, instead of God bless your, you know, soul. I would say, Father, God bless your dirty heart. Those fellows, they get up there and, and, and preach, and they take on the world and the flesh and the devil, and they tell them off, and they're, they speak up. They speak up. Do you warn your children about strange men picking them up in cars? Preach. Do you warn your children about taking candy from strangers? Do you warn your kids about open light sockets? Do you warn your kids about playing with matches and guns? Of course you do. How come you don't warn the unsaved people about going to hell if you believe it? Amen. See me like if you believe it, you say something about it. Could a mariner sit idle if he heard the drowning cry? Could a real doctor sit in comfort knowing his patients all die? Could a fireman watch men perish and not give a helping hand? Can you sit at ease in Zion with the world around you damned? That's the question. Can you do that? I mean, speak up. Say something. Say something. Open your mouth. One time a preacher was sitting on a plane flying along up there in the air and had his Bible open in his lap and been reading it. He put it down for a while. Stewart has been watching him for a while and didn't say anything. Pretty soon he put down his Bible. Put down his Bible and then he sort of sat there and he got humming. And he got humming and she came by and said, uh, what are you singing? He said, rock and roll. Hey, and she's been watching the Bible and she said, rock and roll, are you a minister? He said, yes. You seen rock and roll? He said, yeah. He said, I'm singing when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And he said, I'm singing rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. <laughs> rock and roll, man, rock and roll. Amen. I mean, speak up, speak up. Amen. One of them street preachers preaching out there, I think it was Jed was preaching out there, and some dyke came up there, you know, and flaunted herself before him and said, you're nothing but a, chauv a chauvinistic pig, she said. And he said, yeah, I think you're a tomboy, too. <laughs> and about that time, where a sexy lady came up there right at that, you know, one of these pair of Levi's got up there, and she said, you know, she said, you think I'm a tomboy? <laughs> he said, no, I think you're a cowboy. <laughs> now, you know what that is? That's a witness. Amen. Now the thing is, any Christian in this building could get full of those things, and when the time comes, slam them. Go <laughs> and get away with all that stuff. Make make them go home thinking, boy. Make them go home thinking. Jed said when that got through, when they got through that thing there, he said that uh, the, both those girls that were like that, they went off in shame. But he said he noticed about two hours later, both of them came back, and both of them came back and heard him preach for over an hour. Amen. Give them something to think about. One of those meetings those fellows having up there, they were uh, 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 talking about this and that thing about homosexuality. And one of those queers said to him, he said, well, he said that there's sexuality among, uh, homosexuality among animals. And he said, are you an animal? <laughs> Amen. And the fellow said, no, but we can bar from their habits. And then Jeb said, well, some of them eat their own young. You going to eat your own offspring? Amen. Make them think. Make them think. Open your mouth. 
I ask God to give you something to say. Now, you know what I'm drawing you here? I'm drawing an eagle up here. Amen. And I call this picture above the clouds. And that fellow's above the storm. God over the top. That's the victorious life. Sin shall have no dominion over you. But you need to, you need to try to win people to Christ. You need to be a soul winner if you possibly can be. You know, I, my wife was out doing person work the other day and went by a place over here someplace where there's a woman called Mary Prince. And Mary Prince was a Catholic who got saved. And when she got saved right away she began to put out literature against the Catholic Church and against the Masons. And they threatened her life and everything else. And she went right ahead and did it. Finally she had a son-in-law come to her and her son-in-law came to her and said he didn't believe in God, didn't believe in Christ, anything else, you know. And she said, uh, would you give me about an hour? Would you list to something for about an hour with me and then I'll let you go and I won't bother you again. And he came in the house. She took out a cassette of my testimony and made that sucker listen to it for an hour. And he got saved right there in the living room. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Got a letter that day from a fellow up north, and he said, My 70 year old grandmother, we brought her down to one of these blowouts last September. She sat there, she was an undersaved Episcopalian. And said, She sat there, and when, I, when we went out, she said, That's a very hard, aggressive man. <laughs> and she didn't like what I had to say. And he said, But she'd been getting under conviction, getting under conviction. And finally, she, he said, I don't know who puts on your, said, I don't know who puts on your uh, radio program up or your television program up here about winning men to Christ, drawing men to Christ. But he said, I got my grandmother to sit down and listen to that the other day. And when that thing was through, we went to church. She walked down the aisle and got saved. Amen. 70 years old, 70 years old. One of the greatest blessings I have in my, in my life I had right here, it must have been about, I don't know, Time with me gets going on. I can't keep track of it. Maybe less than a year ago, but Brother Jordy been praying with his brother and got his brother down here. He was a, he was a case. He was a case. And then one day came into my studio there in the living room, back to the studio down at the house. And after about 30 minutes to talk, we all got on our knees there, and his brother got saved. Amen. You don't know what a blessing that is. See a grown man get like that, and then straighten up and try to do something for God. Now, you know what those things are? Those are the basics. You want to fly above the clouds? That's how you fly high, young man. Amen. That's how you fly high. And you need all seven. You need all seven. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we thank for the book. We thank for the guide, the dead reckoning, the sure promise. We thank for absolute truth. We have it, and you gave it to us. You didn't leave us to wander around here in the dark. And we just pray you might bless our efforts to turn the light to some others who are still in the dark. We pray my bless the efforts of this church. And we thank God for the young men that have gone out from this church. And we thank God for our church members who have stayed by the stuff and loyally supported them year after year while they get the job done where they are. And we pray that you might give your own people here victory over sin in their own personal lives. May they mount up with wings like eagles. And, and walk and not be weary and run not be faint like you said. You said those who wait upon the Lord will wind up that way. May they bear fruit in old age like a tree planted by the rivers of waters whose leaf fadeth not, neither does it cease from yielding fruit. It'll help some young person here to take hold of these things and, and begin to claim promises and begin to memorize Scripture and begin to apply them and begin to live the crucified life day by day. And give them victory that sin won't reign over them in their mortal bodies. They should obey it in the lust thereof. I'll just remain in prayer. The Lord is speaking your heart about coming forward and leading you at the altar. Feel free to come. Nobody's going to bother you. You do your own praying. Nobody's going to pry and poke around your personal affairs if you don't want them to. But if you're here tonight, you're not a Christian. There'll be somebody here to meet you, to deal with you if you want help. If you want help, be some here. Glad to deal with you. And let me say this in closing: while the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, young people and older people here tonight, <coughs> the thing is, one day at a time. <coughs> get your mind off out next week and next month. Ask yourself when you get up tomorrow morning, what can I deny myself today? Amen. When I get up tomorrow morning, what can I deny myself today? The the luxury of complaining. <laughs> The luxury of griping, the privilege of complaining, something. There's something I can quit. There's something I can deny myself for Christ's sake. There's something I can deny myself. The luxury of bad feelings about people. 
and hard attitude and bad attitude, the luxury of indulging in thoughts that are displeasing to God. You get up tomorrow morning and say, Lord, now today, today, what can I deny myself today? And then head through the day. When the sun goes down, you'll be above the clouds. You'll be above the clouds. Anybody here want at the front want to help, raise your hand. If not, all right. If, any, if not, don't worry about it. If you want some help, just raise your hand. We'd be glad to help you. Brother Donovan, somebody here. Have prayer with your counselor with you. I don't think we'll sing tonight. We'll just tarry a few minutes in prayer before we leave. I know this hasn't been much, much of a message, but these are the basics. These are the basics. These are the things you need. You need. You don't have to be a student. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a man. Be a woman, a boy, a girl. Fourth grade education, sixth grade education. It don't make no difference. These are the basics. That's how to get out from under the circumstances. We'll tie a couple more minutes by the clock. If anybody else like to come, come ahead. Anybody here not saved, you'd like to accept Christ, you come, be somebody here to deal with you. Show you how.